Uh, in A64, there's actually one of the rule mandates is the department's going to have to determine the qualifications for licensure that are directly and demonstrably related to the operation of a marijuana establishment. Now, if everybody lined up and rendered an opinion as to really what that means in plain English, none of us would agree, right? And so that's why it's critical that you have a voice again in that legislative process very early on to help define some of those parameters going forward. But really what I wanted to tell you is in a previous life, I had one, uh, in a previous life I regulated the uh, alcohol beverage industry for about 30 years, so I know a little bit about that side of things. And just to kind of let you know um, what you could potentially see, um, having read A A64 as well, um, Colorado employs, as do many states, something called a traditional three-tier system. Um, and ironically, I, I've been to California ten times this summer to uh, talk to them about cannabis regulation, and this is the very model that I've proposed to them. Um, but nonetheless, there, there are three tiers, manufacturers, wholesalers, and retailers. Uh, and what I suspect is Laura Harris, who's the director of MMED currently, um, also came from beverage alcohol side of things, and she will probably, at least in the very early stages, look at that system. Now, the perils to that system and why it's set up that way, uh, it was truly structured so that retailers had to operate independent of wholesalers and wholesalers independent of manufacturers. And that is, each tier had to operate on their own. They couldn't receive assistance, direction, control, or anything from the other because that's how you control a market, right? It's how you get a monopoly. And that's what Prohibition taught us. The manufacturers were telling the, the bars in those days when they could open, what kind of beer they would serve, how much they would sell it for, to whom they would sell it, all of those kinds of things. And so my guess is, historically, um, they will probably look at, at a lot of the basic tenets of that regulatory model that's been around since the repeal of Prohibition uh, going forward when they craft the model for this industry. So something to think about. So there's that. Do not assume that this second term president who doesn't have to run for re-election again, who does want to be a historical figure, don't assume he opposes Amendment 64. I mean, Amendment 64 was such a game changer that the feds have to take notice. They have taken notice. In fact, this got, as has been alluded to, 50,000 more votes than Barack Obama himself in Colorado. So there are 50,000 people out there, literally, who voted for marijuana and didn't vote for 55, Barack Obama. 55, they notice that. They understand that. They want to be on the right side of history. They re the federal government, the United States Department of Justice, does have an admirable history. I mean, they've done some horrible things to people over the years, but they've also done some good things. And do not assume that they're necessarily against this. And by the way, the silence is deafening from them, all right? Did anybody hear the Department of Justice say one single word about <laughs> Amendment 64 during the entire campaign? They, they said zero. They, they said nothing about it. And they did say something about it in California. The U United States Attorney General came to California, said vote against this. If you don't, we'll do this, this, and that. They didn't even say that here. They didn't even make a threat. They were silent. And there is a plausible legal defense, an actual legal defense. Silence is consent. So they had their chance to opine on Amendment 64, the federal government. They had plenty of chances. They declined to, to issue any opinion. They were even asked to come here. The No on 64 campaign, a bunch of right-wing, federalist, conservative Republicans begged the Obama administration to come here to Colorado and tell us rednecks what, what we should do with our um, state constitution. And, and, they, and the Department of Justice declined. They said, sorry, we're not, they did, actually they didn't say anything. They didn't even say no. They just did nothing. So don't assume that the feds are necessarily against this because six, they can read 64. And by the way, that's their press release after 64 passed. We're studying Amendment 64. Studying it. This has been out there for a year, and you're smart lawyers with the Department of Justice. You know every single word that's in 64. So, no, you're not studying it. You know what it says. What you're they're, studying... They're studying the, politi the politics. Yeah, you're studying 55% of Colorado voters who pay taxes and pay for your salaries. That's what you're studying, and you're thinking hard about that. So, you know what? I'm, at this point, and I said this, I said this two weeks ago, I'm just going to stop demonizing the federal government. I'm going to stop attacking them. I'm going to stop saying anything negative about them because until informed otherwise, I am Since assuming when? they are on our side. 
They, the federal government has not informed us that they're against us. And the, the Attorney General of Colorado says, please state your intentions, federal Caesar. Please tell us what you intend to do. They, they've said nothing. So the silence continues, and I'm going to take an optimistic view and assume they're on our side until informed explicitly otherwise. Um, will A64 allow out-of-state investment? Rob seems to believe it will. Um, in recreational MJ businesses, but how safe will those investments be given the federal status of MJ and the Blue Sky ruling? And as far as the out-of-state investment is concerned, this is a little bit different than the residency, you know, required ID, which I feel obviously very strongly about. Um, that is something that, depending on how it's outlined, it does, that would then involve interstate commerce in a much more significant way than the Reich case, or, you know, than, than these kind of really you know, the intrastate model that we, that, that Matt here developed to, to really show that this is not a um, going to touch interstate commerce. But again, it's one of those things that I'm waiting to see how they react. I'm waiting to see, not they, the feds, I'm waiting to see how the state reacts and how they, what they think is right. I mean, there is a certain level of people, I'm sure people in this room, that feel very strongly that all of a sudden a bunch of money flooding in here to, uh, bolster up businesses that shouldn't be there maybe in the first place or to start businesses that will only make us all look bad. Those are very, very legitimate state concerns. Again, I'm not going to talk about why, whether or not we should do it because of the feds, but there are legitimate state concerns for addressing the issue of out-of-state investment. And, you know, it happens anyways now. You know, there's people that think they've figured out ways to do it. Um, you know, it's generally not the way we practice, uh, but there certainly are you know, people that have figured out things to do uh, inside the rules, on the edge of the rules, whatever. But I think it makes sense for us to have a serious discussion about this with the legislature. And also it makes sense to have backup plans which say that at some point if the Controlled Substances Act does change because it's over, it's just a matter of time um, with marijuana, at that point do we want to lock ourselves into a situation where we don't have out-of-state investment? Is At that point do we want to allow, like I said, Colorado to take the lead as we should and as we've earned on this issue going forward. And so this is why, you know, as many smart people at the table as possible to think about these things is, is exactly what's needed. And, you know, again, I, I don't approach it from what are the feds going to do. I'm approaching it for what's good for Colorado. DUI, DUID. Okay, even though MMJ states have lower DUI arrests than non-MMJ states, A64 keeps driving under the influence law in the Constitution. And I know we've been fighting this bill at every single legislative session. I don't see how we could have passed it without it. I mean, beans that, that we're regulating it like alcohol and that's what we do. Um, you know, that's probably the big money maker here. How are we going to go about this and what, what can we expect for these DUIs? Mike? Basically, Amendment 64 did not affect our DUID laws in Colorado at all. In Washington, uh, they actually had five nanograms per se written into uh, the law that, that was passed there. But um, I'll tell you that MMIG, we've made it, I, I imagine we've spent more resources defeating the five nanogram per se bill than probably any other issue that we've worked on. And um, that's because, well, one of the reasons is because this thing just keeps coming back. This is a zombie bill. I can't tell you. I, I've been embarrassed the amount of times I have emailed everyone I know saying this bill is dead and then... <laughs> In some cases, 10 minutes later, it's back alive again. Uh, I think it was 10 minutes, yes. Um, now, I mean, here's, here's the thing. This issue, um, we, uh, Chloe and I just talked about it earlier today. Uh, the January 17th version of this, the Cloverleaf uh, Forum, is going to be on this issue. And uh, why? It's because uh, we've got way more to talk about than we have time for right now. But to give you a very brief piece of information, something that is not really out there in the public that is extremely important, is that uh, this group called the CCJJ, that's the Colorado Commission on Criminal and Juvenile Justice. Um, well, they just took a position on DUID going forward. And that matters because this commission has really been put together by the governor's office. The attorney general has a seat there, uh, district attorneys have seats there, defense attorneys, some other state agencies. Uh, it's a powerful, powerful group. And uh, the original five nanogram per se bill originated with the CCJJ back in the late 2010 and then they pushed forward in 2011. 
This group, after a long period of deliberation, just voted, um, I believe it was a week and a half ago, to endorse not, not five nanograms per se, but five nanograms permissible inference. And when we look at that, I know, well, I'm judging by the silence in this room that nobody knows what on earth that means. <laughs> Hence why we need a forum about it. Because I think there's going to be some disagreement about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. But to give you a very brief overview, if it's per se, that means you cannot introduce evidence that you were not impaired. If it's permissible inference, that means you can. And why this is such a significant thing is that Senator Steve King, who has been leading this effort uh, to pass per se, he's a member of the CCJJ. He was okay with this compromise. And I think, I think, and gee, I, I, I say this and now I have to catch myself every, every time because the zombie per se bill keeps coming back alive. Because Senator King was the one who was gonna push per se and now he's on the CCJJ and they've endorsed permissible inference, I believe per se might possibly, maybe, could be, <laughs> could be dead. But permissible inference is alive and well and is going to probably be a much more popular uh, proposal with the legislators. And I think we as a community are going to have to decide, are we for it? Are we against it? Do we just say that this is the reasonable compromise that we've been fighting for over the last couple of years? And, uh, and there you go. So uh, that'll be in January and I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, I see that as an important compromise because what I said was now we have a fighting chance. I think it's unrealistic to believe with the way we've, well, that's not fair either. We've, we've won for the past two years. So um, maybe we can win a third year. Uh, but with the way they continue to go at it with Mark Waller and uh, Steve King and I'm sure the whole law enforcement community are so adamant that we just have to have this per se, the fact that we have a fighting chance with the um, inference allows you, what it, what it does for you, if you get caught and charged with DUID, um, it allows you to go to trial. I mean, I, I, theoretically, you could convince district attorneys that um, your client wasn't impaired, but you know, that'll probably fall on deaf ears. But you could go to trial and in front of a jury present evidence that this person clearly was not impaired because chronic users, you know, carrying five nanograms in your blood of THC is commonplace. Um, the last piece that I think is the most important uh, or very important, if we do get the permissive inference, to educate folks in the community to not take the roadsides. It's voluntary. Do not take the roadsides because then you take away a lot of the, well, half of their evidence against you. And then they want you to go do the, D, the DRE exam, which is a big roadside. Don't do it because that is voluntary. So if we take away the roadsides and you don't do them, and you take away the DRE, and all you have to do is give blood to keep your license so you don't lose it for a year or more, now you're in great shape if you want to fight it. So I won't write, you know, I won't take up all of our time, but you know, there's possibilities here. At least we have a fighting chance. Um, this issue is not going away, and um, I am not a proponent of the permissible inference because when you tell a jury you can presume somebody is high, they will presume they were high. So I, I think uh, we got to figure out other alternatives. I know Mike, Mike deserves a ton of credit for the work he's doing. Um, but I think he's the, heading in the right direction because he's saying that we need to make the roadsides better, maybe marijuana specific. Uh, we need to look at other factors because the blood test does not correlate to mental impairment and we can never give up on that idea and people need to understand the science is not clear. So yeah, look out for that. 
that not only will affect you in the criminal law and DUID world, but can trickle down into the wonderful world of social services and divorces. And it would really suck if we set a standard of like five nanograms that then we're dealing with social service caseworkers who are saying mom and dad are always intoxicated under that standard. And for most patients and regular recreational users, that would in fact be the case. And what kind of field day would, could you have, particularly in some of these rural counties, with a divorce where one parent or the other is a recreational marijuana user, and you get to kick back and argue a parenting time schedule where one parent is always intoxicated under the five nanogram standard. So, you know, I'm personally not only worried about the DUID thing, but then them coming and taking our kids. Yeah. Just like a lot of things that we've seen, what you're allowed to do is going to be governed by where you are. And if you are in a jurisdiction that bans recreational marijuana and you've invested millions of dollars in buying a warehouse or buying a retail center or whatever, it's going to be too bad, so sad. The city governments do not advertise in a way that you're going to be able to ferret it out easily. So watch your city councils and make sure you understand what they're doing. Because they could do something as benign and say, okay, we're going to do a thousand foot separation between you and schools, you and each other, you and parks. And if you draw enough thousand foot circles, you wind, with a wind up with a 10, a 10 square foot area underneath a bridge somewhere. So watch these people and make sure that you're heard. If you want the business to move forward, you cannot let them walk all over you, and they will if you let them. Sometimes it's on purpose and sometimes it's inadvertent, but you have to be the educators because you're the ones who know what it's going to take in order to operate in the area that you want to operate. So you've got to watch them. You know, the 280E is basically saying that you can't write off any of your retail expenses um, things like that. Do you think that's going to be different for recreational? Uh, I think we've moved a giant step forward in saying that 280E does not contemplate any of this. When it was written, it didn't contemplate what's happening now. And now it's compromise at the, on the table. We're opening up the tax code of, you know, to do all sorts of wonderful things this next federal legislative session. And we got our people in place to make the moves to change that. You can find a copy of this video on www.yourmmjinfo.com. You can visit us. Um, any questions you have, you can send to Cloverleaf Consulting at Gmail. I want to thank the panel for being here tonight. You guys did a wonderful job. And um, any questions you have for them, just let us know and we'll send you their way. Um, thank you for all being here. Make sure to look up Sadie Lane. We have Shar in the back. She just wrote a book here, The Colorado Marijuana Highway 420. And a lot of the people she wrote about in this book could actually sign it for you. I know Matt Cook, Rob Corey. Um, we have a few people in here that are in the book. So feel free to stop by on your way out. And thank you for coming. Thanks,